Radio. Uh... Hello, everyone. This is Chris, and I'd like to welcome you to this conversation about your Kundalini Awakening experiences. Uh, we are starting the show three hours early, uh, and so this is a new time, and I'd like to try to keep this time, so I hope it's working for everybody. Um, uh, <laughs> it's a bit different for me. I stay up pretty late. So I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna hope that uh, things go as they normally go here. Uh, right off the bat, though, I want to check in with the chat room, make sure everybody's uh, hearing this. Manisha says the sound is fine, and she's all the way in Germany, and uh, so I appreciate that sound check there, Manisha. And if anybody else wants to give me a sound check here, I'm very welcome or welcoming of that. Very grateful for that. And so here we are. Okay, looks like people in the chat room. All right, so, and we have some callers too. So there we have it. Uh, The first thing I would like to do is I'd like to thank everybody who came to the Denver seminar. It was uh, was a very beautiful, beautiful, beautiful experience. I'd like to thank Mohan, or who I call Mohan Ananda, uh, for organizing it and Rosemary Goliath for organizing it and everybody who came uh, from all parts of the country, uh, San Diego, Ohio, Arkansas, Minnesota, California, uh, lots of uh, beautiful, beautiful people. And it was a very, very nice, very nice uh, uh, environment too. the, the uh, it was a Marriott hotel uh, in the in the city of Broomfield, and uh, had everything you know we were looking for as far as privacy and uh, a, a very c- uh, comfortable room. We had more room than we needed, and so it was very 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 positive. And uh, I just want to say once again thank you to everybody who came. Thank you to the organizers, and uh, looking forward to uh, coming back to to Denver and doing another one. Uh, hopefully the same time next year. So we'll see how that how that uh, materializes. But it was an excellent, beautiful uh, joining. I was oh my gosh, the bliss was was too much for me. <laughs> I went into bliss I think ten or eleven, twelve times, uh, more so than I usually do. But I, I think partially that's part of my process too. It's just getting more and more. Uh, intense when I when I work with people in in these ways so it was a very good meeting and I'm looking forward uh, with great anticipation to uh, to Germany now and and uh, Manisha's group and uh, in Karlsruhe Germany I'm pretty sure I'm going to ask Manisha right now Uh, Manisha is it a sold out program is it a sold out program Manisha coming to Manisha and uh <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what she's saying here. Uh yeah. So Manisha says it's a sold out program. So so I'm looking forward to meeting everybody in, in Carlsruhe, uh at Manisha's uh place there. And uh Manisha, I don't have the ticket information in front of me right now, so I don't know what time I'm coming in. I am coming in on the day. I'll be leaving on a Sunday, probably coming in there on a Monday, uh, if everything goes well. You never know. You know, you never know how well these things go with the airlines. That's the uh, the pseudo outline for it, though. Oh, boy. Lots of stuff coming up. I have been guided by the Kundalini to look into the ancient texts the ancient um, uh, the ancient shamanic uh, connections of the of the people uh, in in the Holy Land about two 
a little over maybe 2,500 years ago, 2,500 years ago. And so I was guided to order these books. And so I've got these books, you know, and I'm looking at their belief systems at the time. And, and a lot of them were doing uh, uh, magical types of things and using entities in certain types of ways. And within the understanding of entities, I'm going to include angels uh, as entities because I'm finding out as I get into these texts that angels were used to wreak havoc on people as well. Uh, angels were used to torture and to, um, to really create <laughs> terrible levels of karma for the practitioner of, of these types of tools. And uh, I believe uh, the subject came up, I, it was either at the seminar or in a previous program here where you know people are asking, well, what made the lower astral? What, what, how did that come into being? And of course, uh, we made the lower astral. Our negative thoughts, our hurtful act actions towards each other and towards this environment, uh, and then of course those those types of entities that were designed to encourage such levels of corruption. So we made that, and and by making that a a level of shall we say heaven had to be created for for the uh, for the earth realm to stay within a level of of innocence people who are coming here that are not necessarily corrupted by any kind of a karmic agenda that includes violence uh, to each other or to to nature uh, would be given an area of purity. So, so the lower astral came into being, and and uh, you know, as I've mentioned before, it's a, it's a, a, it's a blended. You know, the higher you get in the physical, uh, one of the first things you encounter is the lower astral, and that would be the hell zone that that many people feel are, are under their feet, where in fact it is, you know, right above their heads. But with the Kundalini, uh, the Kundalini will draw from these, as we've mentioned in previous programs. We won't go too far into it right now. Kundalini draws on the hell zone in order to procure the appropriate type of corruptive entity that will give the Kundalini person the necessary testing they require that they may be seen and, and respond uh, as the holy person or the divine, semi-divine person that the Kundalini will be transforming them into, and they will receive that lesson or those tests for as long as it is necessary uh, until they begin to express from an ego less or, or as much as possible an ego free position. And I don't care how long you've had it. And I don't care what voices may tell you or what uh, your tarot cards or whatever it is people, you know, use to communicate with themselves, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, these entities will stay with you. These issues will stay with you as long as, as you need that level of, of uh, clearance to be given to you. So, so yeah, so I've been diving into these ancient, ancient texts. It's, it's quite an eye opener actually, when you read some of these magical texts that they're using in, and they're basically saying that, uh, you know, the stuff that was used in, 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 in Israel was used by the was used by the Syrians, was used by the Greeks, was used by the Romans, was used by the Egyptians, uh, you know, was used by the ancient Hebrew. And they were all using basically the same thing throughout the, the ancient world. Uh, most of the stuff came from, not surprisingly, the Egyptians and the Egyptians, miss, the Egyptian mystery school would have developed this, and then uh, the other people would have taken it and and uh, pursued it uh, within their own contexts back then. And uh, so you never know how how viable these are as as you know when people reinterpret things, they change things, and when you change things, you know some of the formula. Uh, kind of get screwed up a little bit 
uh, they talk a lot about controlling angels and controlling this and controlling that. So from a Kundalini context, I'm seeing all of this and I'm looking at it and I'm kind of going, wow, there's a lot of karma being created here. You know, they wanted things the easy way, just like we do right now. They didn't want to have to work for it. They didn't want to have to gain it. They didn't want to have to work at trust. They just wanted to inflict an angel upon a person or a situation and then count on that angel and your supposed control over that angel to do the work. They divided things up into to seven heavens. Well, of course, there are seven heavens, but not in the way that they're describing them in some of these texts. Uh, you know, and, and there, are, there are, are leadership angels and then sub angels and then a whole platoon, I guess, <laughs> of angels. And uh, some of the angels are just waiting to be commanded, you know, according to these ancient texts. And, and these ancient texts are, are a root of, of some of the most powerful and, and continuous belief systems on this planet here. These are not, these are not uh, uh, um, these are not ancient manuscripts from from uh, from civilizations that have died. Even though, of course, we don't have the Romans anymore, and we don't have uh, uh, the Egyptian mystery school that we know of. I believe it actually does still exist, but not in a not in a popular state. Uh, these texts relate to a time when everything was kind of on the table. Everything was on the table, and and I have to say that some of these recipes are still very, very, very powerful and very, very tangible, and uh, they do have they do have a place in this world, or they wouldn't be in it, right? Um, as I was mentioning in a few shows ago, or last show, I forget. Uh, the entities have the ability to to coerce minds. They can coerce your mind. They can say, oh, hey, you know, Chris, I want you to, you know, isn't it better to have chocolate rather than vanilla? You know, chocolate's more dense and it you know, has that taste. And you grew up with it. And vanilla, well, you know, I mean, it's just kind of dull. It's kind of like not interesting. It's, you know, why have vanilla? You know, and so they'll, they'll coerce you to make one one decision over another, a decision that typically serves a corruption, corruptive choice. And I'm not suggesting that chocolate is corruptive, except when used in excess. <laughs> and there is white chocolate too. So, uh, so yeah, she's been she's been driving me to look into these things, uh, and it has actually more to do with with uh, emergency entity control where you, you know, the person is so far out on the edge that, you know, they're looking at suicide or they're looking at, you know, some really, really terrible thing happening to them and they don't have the time to realize that they're being tested. And so this, these are along the lines. It's, it, it's a, it's more of a personal teaching for me rather than a, than something uh, for everybody here to do. But I'm just kind of giving you what's been happening with me lately. Uh, the most, and, and this really leads up to an interesting aspect of the conversation, which is uh, having the belief in the kundalini within yourself, having that confidence and that trust in the belief in the kundalini. It's so, so very important. And uh, looking at some of the newer uh, folks coming up uh, here, and uh, <laughs> what is this? Uh, oh, they spell May wrong. Uh, looking at the chat room here. So, hello, everybody. This is the new time zone. This is the new time zone for me. I'm still kind of sleepy. I was up very late last night. Um, but uh, so it's so very, very important for you to have trust and confidence in your Kundalini equation. This is what the ancient people, I, I think some of them had this. Now, remember, we're talking uh, before Christ, 
and during Christ and a little bit after the time of Christ. So about anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 years ago, uh, sorcery, magic was the big deal. That was the, the, the quick way. And, and, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm going, wow, some of this stuff really did work. Some of the stuff, a Bremelin the mage. And I was, I was kind of, in my mind, I was kind of directed to look at a Bremelin the mage. And I've read his book, and I, and I actually got rid of his book because it was, well, it was really a powerful, powerful thing. And, but she's saying, I have to get it again, so I'll be reordering that book. But uh, at times of trouble, you know, like say when you're having a, a kundalini induced fragmentation or or you're having a, a dark night of the soul a kundalini induced dns the last thing people need to reach for is something like a bremel and the mage you're going to get in very deep trouble very 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 deep trouble and one of the interesting things that i find with uh with these ancient manuscripts these ancient sorcery type magical recipes is is they always say, do this with purity. Do this with purity. And I've got, I've got news for you. None of you are pure. <laughs> no one on this earth is pure the way I understand purity to be or the way the Kundalini in me suggests that purity needs to be. Uh, we are all haunted by our ego, our fear of loss, and our want of gain. And until those two equations come under control... You're not pure. You're not pure. A two-year-old is pure. A four, five, six-year-old is pure. Uh, after six, you start getting an ego, and you start kind of going, e maybe not. A lot of the sorcerers would use six-year-olds, five, four, five, and six-year-olds, to do certain tasks within the, the equation because of their purity, you see. They, uh, they all knew this. And so they use that small child as a go-between. Uh, I know Bremelin would do this with demons. He would get a six-year-old, and he would use that six-year-old as the go-between. Uh, that six-year-old would step out of the circle of protection and uh, would offer you know, to God certain things. And uh, and because of the purity of the six-year-old, you know, God would totally take care of that six-year-old. And that stuff would work. I mean, you know, we're talking about weather control. We're talking about financial control. We're talking about inflicting death or harm on other people. We're talking about we're talking about love things. You know, attracting a, you know the person that you think you want uh, in your life. Uh, we're talking about manipulation of social behavior, uh, weather behavior, ast you know, astronomical behavior, things of this nature. And it takes a very, very, very strong level of purity not to fall from grace within these types of uh, recipes. And I know that people are doing this now. People are doing this now. Okay. And they're falling. One out of ten persons will be able to do this successfully. And even there, that's negligible. She just showed me that, that, that comparison. And so it's really, really, really important for you to do the self-work, to do the work on the, on the ego, to practice the safety. If you're going to fall into these, into these areas of the removal of choice of other people, well, you've already committed an act of karma. If you think that your wants and your desires are more important than the freedom of choice that the other person has, then, you know, you've already committed an, a, a sin in a way. You've already committed a very big mistake because you're not really caring about what their choice is. All you're caring about is what your choice is. And this is the great problem with with sorcery and magic, you know, when they're, when they're operated in such ways. Now, if you're using sorcery and magic to, to, uh, to increase your bank account, that's a little less karmically oriented that, you know, 
that's basically just on you unless you're trying to steal it. So let's just say, uh, uh, you know, Rosemary, our, our highly vaunted uh, mother superior who, who doesn't listen to her teacher, will say Rosemary uh, wants to steal Amelia's wedding ring. She wants to hawk it at the pawn shop. <laughs> well, then, then, then she has incurred, you know, a level of uh, a level uh, a level of sin because she's once again she's impacting another person. If you're just impacting yourself, say, let's say you're going to go to a casino or a, a race, horse races, you know, basically just different levels of gambling that doesn't include taking advantage of a person, well, then some of these recipes will work. Uh, and you will not, as such, uh, open yourself to as much karma. Although, if you, do the, uh, if you do the incantation wrong, well, then you can open yourself to demonic control by verses. This is, once again, this feeds right into fear of loss and want of gain. You want to gain, and you're afraid of losing. Back and forth you go within that hamster cage. Back and forth you go. Fear of loss, want of gain. Fear of loss, want of gain. Uh, and you really got to step outside of these parameters for Kundalini. And the Kundalini will force you to step outside of these parameters. So the interesting thing when I'm looking at these ancient texts and manuscripts and whatnot, and I'm, I'm kind of going, well, okay, people really wanted an easier way to do things, basically. An easier way to succeed. Uh, an easier way to dominate your enemy, an easier way to commit acts of, of greatness without having to do much. You know, you just instruct the angel or the demon to do the work. And some of them are more than willing to let you try. Enochian magic is all about this. Uh, but what you don't realize is that they'll consume you at the same time. Once you have success, well, then, oh, my gosh, you have success. And you're just like, going, wow, wow, I, you know, I, I made some money on that deal. Let's do it again and again and again and again and again. And you get caught in that trap. You get caught in that trap. And not only are you, are you caught in the trap of your own, uh, we'll call it greed or fear of loss, uh, but you're trapped within the, the 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 struggle with the demonic that you've been using, or the angelic that you've been using. As I said, uh, you know, there's a whole uh, quadrant of angels that are not nice people. I'm not talking about the fallen angels. This is not stuff that's in the Bible, by the way. So for those of you that are going, oh yeah, I know all of them. No, it's not in the Bible. It predates the Bible. It's long before the Bible ever existed. Okay. And and so you've got to be very, very, very careful with these things. Because some of them do work. And, and I do feel that some of them had a very, very uh, impactful role in the creation of World War II. And, you you know, some of these things were allowed to get loose into society and to affect uh, people who are making decisions. And that, of course, you know, turned into the, the horror that World War II was. And, you know, we're kind of looking at another war somewhere around the world springing up. I know that uh, 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 Israel and Syria and Iran and uh, Afghanistan uh, these areas are starting to heat up again, uh, you know, and you got to remember that, you know, they have these huge bombs. I watched a bomb go off uh, in, a, in, in an attack on uh, an Iranian outpost in Syria. It's just a huge, huge, huge bomb. And it doesn't just kill those soldiers that, uh, that are participating in this way, but it kills all the, all the people around it, the city. And the animals, and it destroys the land in very specific ways. Uh, we really need to change the way we behave. And yet, and yet, people have to live their karma too. 
They have to know what it is that they're doing and to take responsibility for what they're doing. And let me tell you something, just because you're flying an airplane and you're, uh, you know, uh, 20,000 feet in the air and you unleash that bomb onto that village, you're responsible for every life that that bomb impacts. Seriously, no joke. I don't care if you were following orders. At any moment, you could have turned that plane around to, oh, you know, I got some sort of failure, <laughs> malfunction. <laughs> you could have done it. So that karma is on you. And in, in, the, in the next lives, you, you may have to really, really struggle to, to come into a balance with that. As uh, you know, we've got one guy here that was in World War II, and, and uh, he was a, a part of an aircraft crew, and uh, he screwed up in some way, and the whole crew died. The whole crew died. And at this moment, right now, as we talk, as we're speaking, this man is being, uh, you know, tortured by the, the entities that were connected to that crew. Every day, every night, he is tortured this way. It's not a pretty sight, and it's part of the cleanup that in order to have the Kundalini, you got to, you've got to pay that debt. And so in, for some of you, you will be paying that debt as your Kundalini comes. Uh, you know, you look at the ancient uh, manuscripts of the Hindu people, and, you know, it's basically saying the same thing. Uh, you know, you you have to have some level of karmic purification uh, before the kundalini will even come. But when it does come, it really collects as much of the karma as you can handle it to be processed at that time. And that will include what you may have done in previous wars, in, with, in previous lifetimes. And let's be clear. Everybody has been part of some war, some time, some way on this world. Everyone. Okay. Maybe except Rosemary. Okay. But everybody's been part of, uh, everybody's been a warrior. Everybody's, you know, committed adultery. Everybody's done all the different sins and transgressions that, that they needed to do to learn from before you get to the kundalini typically i'm not going to be absolutist with this because sometimes people are reaching the kundalini while they're within a war zone that is not uncommon but their previous lives have supported it the previous lifetimes have have supported it so it's very important for people to begin to understand that when the kundalini comes up you're going to be presented with specific challenges that are based upon specific actions that you took uh, in very specific ways in previous lifetimes, not just the past one, not just the, the most recent one, but let's go all the way back. Let's go back a hundred lifetimes of what you were doing back then. Maybe you were an Egyptian scholar who berated a student to the point where they were put to death because they weren't listening well enough to you because they would have done that. <laughs> They would have done that back then. Okay. That would be on the karma of the teacher. All right. So uh, it's important for people to understand that, that there are some ways of, of doing that type of work. If, if you are pure, if you so let's just say, if you're doing it, uh, to uh, to help another person. The best way to do these types of things is to pray to your kundalini and have her do them with you. Uh, don't need to, to employ an angel or a demon to do this work. All you need to do is to have the kundalini in the awakened or activated format and to ask the kundalini to help you in that way. And if it is appropriate for you or for that person a way will be given. A way will be given. And don't be surprised. Don't be surprised because uh, for many of you within the Kundalini, you have a very specific agenda that you're not aware of. 
you're not aware of the agenda, and it's just going to pop on you a very specific level of understanding that you have to act on very quickly. And you've got to trust that this is what is occurring because your ego is going to want to sit there and question it uh, until the cows come home. And it's just not, you're just wasting time. So when the ego pops its agenda upon you, uh, as surprising as it may be, you need to respond. You need to respond quickly. And you need to respond with surety and courage and confidence without fear. Because when you start asking for things and then she materializes them instantly or within a short period of time, you got to remember that you've asked for it. You have asked for it. And as I've said in other programs, when you're speaking to the Kundalini, she is listening. And when you give yourself in certain ways, it is real. If you use certain terminology and certain, like say within a mantra, that is heard. That is heard. And it is acted upon. You've got to be very important about what you're saying, what you're thinking, what you're doing within a Kundalini context. It's not that the Kundalini is just a mindless puppet that you can like, you know, use to, to shake the piggy bank. It's not that way at all. It's extremely conscious, but it also understands that it wants you to learn from the things that you're doing. It wants you to learn what it is to, to give yourself to Kundalini or to give yourself to a teacher, or to give yourself in these ways. And it does. And just because, you know, you may have, uh, some sort of a, a reason to, to run away or to stop or to, you know, everything from fear to self-aggrandizement to, to being released to whatever it is, uh, what you have said and done uh, in the, in, within this lifetime has been heard. And it may still be acted upon whether or not you're, you're consistently involved with it or not. got to remember that divinity and, and, and higher spiritual awareness are outside of the constraints of time. So just because you were saying something like last year or 10 years ago doesn't mean that it hasn't been heard by the Kundalini. Doesn't mean that it's not going to be acted out uh, within your lifetime just because you said it 10 years ago. It's all about the refinement. And if this it uh, aids your refinement, then it will come into fruition because you gave it permission through the words you were saying. And so it ties right back into the incantations of these magical recipes that people were saying in the ancient world. Just because you decide, oh, I'm not going to be a sorcerer anymore. Okay, wow, man, I really screwed that one up, man. Jeez Louise, that guy's growing another head out of his left knee and uh you know and I'm, you know who wants a head on their left knee you know you can make mistakes but you pay a terrible 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 price when you make mistakes within the higher spiritual awarenesses if, so in other words if you're incorporating the base uh uh malignant understandings of a five cents human being into the divine realm, which is what these folks are doing. This is what they're doing. Okay. They're using the divine realm as a way to augment their five cents, limited life, limited understanding, Maya uh, infused lifetime. Instead of just being pure and giving themselves to, to God or to grace or to Kundalini, uh, they are giving themselves to the way to fulfill ego wants and desires. And so in, in a sense, they're inserting mundane wants and desires, fears and tribulations into the heavenly environment. And the very fact that humans are able to do that uh, attests to the reasons why uh, you know, some of the angels really rebelled. I mean, we're really given the opportunity to 
intermix with the divine. But the best way, the safest way, the most profound way is to is to allow the kundalini within you to intermix you into the divine environment, the heavenly environment, which starts within. It starts inside of yourself. It doesn't start outside of yourself in the lower astral. Comprenez-vous? <laughs> Intended? <laughs> so it's important for people to understand that. Uh, it's very important for people to understand that. So the, the interesting thing is as I read through these ancient texts, uh, once again, they say, do this with purity. Well, what is purity? Is it the purity of a six-year-old? Because you're not going to get there, folks. <laughs> you're going to have to have your memories wiped out in order for you to get regressed back to being a six-year-old. So what else does purity mean? Maybe it means to be outside of the fear of loss and the want of gain. And yet, if you're asking for something, well, then there's the want of gain. And if you're asking for a healing, well, there's the fear of loss, the fear of loss of health, the fear of loss of life. So it's, it's an interesting little puzzle. So what else does purity mean? Perhaps it means sincerity. Um, perhaps it means to be pure of heart, where, where you're not trying to hurt someone. You're not trying to, to uh, you're, maybe you want to be helpful. Maybe you want to heal the blind and raise the dead. Well, raising the dead is going to be a, a bad deal all the way around for everybody. So I won't suggest you do that. But healing the sick and, and healing the blind and, you know, that has some various possibilities within these areas. And once again, the best way to go with this is to work with your kundalini. Work with your kundalini by giving yourself to her. By giving yourself to the sacred feminine, the sacred mother, in addition to the sacred father, the sacred masculine. And the sacred mother and sacred masculine go under all these different names. You know, we've got Krishna, we've got Shiva, we've got Shakti, we've got all the different Hindu pantheon of gods. We've got Mother Mary, we've got uh, Mary Magdalene, we've got Jesus. You know, so there, you know, in the Christian, we've got Buddha, we've got Kuan Yin, we've got the various feminine Taras uh, within Buddhism. Uh, you know, so yeah, repeated throughout humanity. It's repeated throughout humanity, and and because it's repeated throughout humanity, you must begin to make sense of it. It is not an accident that the sacred masculine and sacred feminine are repeated so much within within the different societies of this world. It is because this is the truth of who we are. And we are direct reflections of sacred masculine, sacred feminine. And so we have the capability to join into that equation of sacred masculine, sacred feminine by virtue of the Kundalini. The Kundalini is literally who we are. We just, we just were allowed to forget we probably it's probably more of a self-induced forgetfulness. I don't think God said, "Okay, I'm going to make them forget now." No, no, it's probably self-induced forgetfulness. And certainly, there's the forgetfulness of past lives as we come into this current life, so that we don't we uh, we we don't literally uh, you know are able to remember what we did last time, thereby. Uh, uh, losing the honesty of our responses in this life. So Kundalini is the way. It is the way. And literally, I feel it is the only way. You know, she takes me back to these 2,000, 3,000-year-old manuscripts, and I, I look at all the mistakes they're making. Oh, yes, and you can use this angel. you got to say his name, and you say it in a certain way on a certain day at a on a certain month, at a certain time, you do this, and, and that angel will come down and smite your enemies. 
he will be smiting these people instead of what? Instead of forgiving them. Instead of maybe calling for some peace and working with them towards peace. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, no. You're smiting them. You're, you're using heavenly consciousness to create violence. Or, consequently, you're using heavenly uh, consciousness to, to feed your greed or to feed your need. Now, feeding the need is different than feeding the greed, although it's, it's, it's very similar. So, you, you know, this is what we have learned now with the Vedas, you know, the Vedas in, in Hinduism, it's very different uh, than, than what you're looking at there in, in uh, Syria, Palestine, Israel, Egypt, um, Italy, the Mesopotamian areas and, and, uh, and the Mediterranean areas. Uh, in India, you know, the, the Vedas, you know, are, are very active at this time, too you know, two to 3,000 years ago. Matter of fact, they've been around for about 4,000 years at that time. So there's a lot to be said for people uh, within the ancient Hindu or the Sanskrit uh, people uh, having the Kundalini and having the wisdom of grace brought to them through the Kundalini, through the actions of the Rishis. The Rishis were the guys and the gals that... Uh, that wrote the Vedas and the, the Veda is spelled V E D A V E D is in dog A. And uh, they, they have very different levels of, of uh, looking at life and how to live a life. Although, you know, they also had people that were trying to go the, the, the short and easy route by using sorcery. There are plenty of, uh, of Hindu sorcerers, even to this day going around and, and I'm, you know, I'm hearing people who say, well, God, black magic was inflicted upon me because I was such a smart kid and black magic was, was inflicted upon me. And now here I am and I'm, I had to struggle to overcome that, blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and I think this is a very real deal. I mean, one of the first seminars I put on was in, had an infestation of, uh, of uh, black magic coming to it by virtue of the entities that were uh that were given to one of the seminar participants and so you know that that was a very very interesting teaching uh that i was given uh, with regards to this stuff and of course now i know how to correct that problem but you know it's, sometimes it's a very steep learning curve and uh and a long lasting learning curve too you know some of the stuff just does not go away and yet you've got to keep persevering. You've got to, to do your best to, to, to make the corrections that, you, that are necessary to be made. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce my co-host. She is the person who supports this program both financially and, and with her presence, her dear presence upon it. And uh, so here we have right now Santara Kundalini. Hi, Santara. Hi, Krishan. Hi, everybody. I'm um, glad you're all here at this new time. Good, 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 good. Um, hope this time suits people. Let's see how it goes, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you expected them to answer or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm okay. looking at the, um, the switchboard, and that's a little quieter than normal. But um, there's yeah, plenty of people yeah. in the chat room, so it's nice to see you all there. And great to hear about the uh, seminar, Chrism. Yeah, the seminar went very, very well. And so many thanks to Mohan and to, and to Rosemary for their excellent organizational skills. And, and uh, nice to, uh, to have been able to meet Mohan face-to-face. He's a very... Very nice, kind, considered, and extremely organized and intelligent operator. So uh, really, really good to meet him and his wife and his son. Uh, beautiful, beautiful people. He showed me the mall. We, <laughs> we went and ate at the mall where he sometimes is, is listening to the show at, maybe even now, uh, you know, where his son takes the, uh, the taekwondo 
uh, classes. Yeah. So that's a very, very big mall. <laughs> a lot of the boys. <laughs> <laughs> very cool, very cool. And I and the topic today is really interesting. Very different, and yeah. The and the ancient, yeah, yeah. It's amazing how you can really see people then making the same mistakes that people are making now. <laughs> That's not so exact surprising, same though. Is just... Well, it's it's surprising to see it in the con. Well, not in the context because the context seems to be the same. Fear of loss and want of gain, and so it's it's really a continuation of that theme, just within different civilizations, and and uh, wow, you know, and a lot of it stems from the Egyptian mystery schools, which which stem really directly from the Atlantean time period. So yeah, it's very 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 interesting to see these extensions. Uh, previous civilizations extending themselves thousands, thousands, and thousands of years later into our present paradigm. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, is is fear of loss and want of gain then, is that, just to simplify it, is that the crux that prevents purity? That, that prevents it. That prevents it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a good way to phrase it too. Yeah, it is the crux. It is the 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 center point of of mm. yeah. You've got to be able to get over that. So when a person can step out of the controls that fear have over them, you know, when they can step out of the control that fear has over them, then they can work these things with purity. And basically what they're saying is when you can step out of your ego, uh, you can, grace will work for you, I guess is what it's saying. When you step out of your ego Mm -hmm. and the controls of the ego, grace will work for you and with you. Over. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Not so easy because there's fear and the, the fear of loss and the, the want of gain is so incredibly huge. I mean, it applies yeah, to everything. Yeah. It applies to the tiniest little thing, you know? I mean, exactly. if you consider in terms of purity or that, that fear of loss and want of gain, let's say somebody does you a wrong and just take that as an example. Well, then... Like part of it is not to trade with the ego, isn't it? Because the ego will prompt you maybe to say something hurtful or to to respond in an angry way, um, because of this fear of loss and want to gain. And that's right. Well, tiny you know, and, and, little... and, and, and take it to another level. I mean, what if a loved one is dying? What if a loved one is dying, and yeah. and you want to change that scenario? You will not accept their death. What about that? Once again, fear of loss. And this is why the, the ancient uh, Sanskrit people and other ancient peoples of the ancient world said, don't be attached to anything or anyone. Attach yourself to grace and grace alone. Do not have expectations. Do not have attachments. Do not allow yourself to fall into the pit of a fear of loss or want of gain. And for parents, that is an incredibly difficult scenario, right? Mm, totally. It's it's really difficult. Um, very hard. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, think about it. Think about it. You know, I mean, yeah. what if a child, a child is like, you know, ill and just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. I don't know a parent that wouldn't be willing to sacrifice their soul on the on the anvil of hell in order to make that child better. Three. Is that okay? So just take that example now. Just can we expand on that prism, okay? Because I think I'm that's standing. something we relate. Yeah. So okay. So. What's the, that is something that's being done out of love, which is, so that's what I mean, expand on that. So that's being done out of love, therefore they're yeah. prepared to 
do? Well, you've got to remember now when you have a child, you have different levels yeah. of love that are that are interacting within within that relationship with that child. There's there's the love of, of regret. Oh my gosh, I raised my child in such a way uh, to to mm-hmm. lead them to this. There's the love of of uh, com- compassion and and oh my God, my child is sick. You know, and and there's the love of of uh, the anger, the the anger that comes with the love, the angry love that says that says, oh my child should not have been swimming with white sharks. What the hell was he doing? You know, there's there's the you know there are all these different basically swimming on the coast of Ireland. Yeah. Uh, there are all these uh, levels of love that are coming into it, and it's not just the 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 overarching single uh, point of love that we all think of when, because we all love our kids. Right. And so Uh there are multiple levels of love that are intersecting into it and everybody will have different levels of love when it comes to these, these multiple intersections of love. And, And so within context, they'll still do the work. They'll still do the incantations. They'll go to a sorcerer. Most people don't know that sorcerers exist, and so they, they don't have the option. But if they knew about it, they'd take that option. They would do anything. Yes. They would do anything mm-hmm. they can do to save their child. So I'm asking you to expand on the error that they're making then. The what, error what, that they're what making they need is, to do is, is what I'm asking it's, it's you. A, yeah. It's a fear of loss and want of gain scenario. You yeah. have got to trust the divine, the Kundalini divine, first and foremost, all scenarios, including that one. And no, this is not but, easy. I am not saying this is easy, but I am saying it is right. Yeah. And it is effective. Which means that and, 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 and let me finish. Let me finish. I'm still expanding yeah, yeah. here. And and as you know, and as you're able to step outside of the paradigm of the fear of loss and want of gain, that is when the divine can work for you. So literally, your fears block a lot of the divine uh, uh, ministrations from coming to you or from coming to your child. Your fears block it. Now, some people would get into a very very deep level of prayer a very deep level of prayer and their prayer can lift them beyond the paradigm of fear of loss and want of gain. Even though they want that child healed, they, they're trusting God. They're trusting God. That goes even further than that. And thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, as it is in heaven. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so as you go into prayer, which is the right thing to do, really, uh, you begin to divest yourself of the attachments you have to the material world, to the, to the uh, mundane emotional world, to the professional world, to the, to the world of, of competition. Uh, you begin to divest yourself from these areas. And so you begin to divest yourself from the fear of loss and want of gain. And as you even momentarily divest yourself from those areas, that is when the divine works for you. And by trusting the divine, you trust that the divine knows what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. And this is true as well. Uh, Sometimes a child must die in order to make the parents better people, passionate people more understanding people, people that have burned through an incredible level of pain and loss. So they know the value of life. So no longer do they take advantage of life they may have once done before they lost that only child. They begin to appreciate other people much more. They begin to have greater levels of forgiveness and compassion and care and consideration. You understand what I'm saying? Do you see that? 
I do prison, yeah. I have another question when you're ready. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Go. So so if we are if we are saying, if we're in a place where we truly are meaning, if it be your will to allow, we're praying, I'm taking the example again of the child that's dying. Um, we want the child to live, yet we move into this place of trusting the divine and if it be your will to allow this occur. Does that mean that the divine will change its mind or does that just mean that we have moved in to that place of trust? Well, it's, it's both. Of whether or not but the child it, dies now, you know? It's not necessarily that the divine has changed its mind. You see, you've got mm-hmm. to remember that the divine knows what is the most appropriate thing. The divine knows yeah. that 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 child needed to die at a young age because to fulfill a karmic debt that that child had. But at the same time that the child died at that young age, the parents of that child had to learn what it is to, to have a child die at that young age in order to fulfill their karmic debt. And so karmic debts are being fulfilled all over the place within that, within that equation. And that includes with extended family members, too, a brother, a sister, a, 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 you know, grandparents and cousins and, and all of this. You know, these folks all come together and they learn the preciousness of life. They learn the consequences of, of causation. And, you know, if you swim off the coast of Ireland, well, you're going to die. It's that <laughs> simple. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so does the divine listen to our prayers, Prism? Absolutely. Okay. We are so observed. We are so watched. People, God, you know, people would be humiliated if they knew how many levels of consciousness were watching them sit on the toilet. <laughs> you know. It's true. Seriously. You know, and, and no, and, I believe you. You know, especially with the toilets in Ireland. I mean, where you have to sit longer <laughs> and spend more time there because you're cleaning it up. No, you just spend more time <laughs> flushing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's not just Ireland. The English aren't much better. <laughs> no, they're about equal, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, German yeah. Toilet. yeah. You know, they they got that porcelain <laughs> wall that just for some reason doesn't have enough porcelain on. I don't know. But it's not as slippery as it is. I don't know. No, it's, it's <laughs> no stuff. Don't be too graphic. But I think it's got to do with the power of the, anyway, never mind. <laughs> of the what? So, there's some, the power of the, the, the shape of the, you know, the, the way water, the water flows. The water, the water, the yeah, water, yeah. yeah the, but anyway. The direction. So, ex, you know, to say some more, Chrism, um, you know, when Jesus was on earth, he removed evil spirits. I mean, was he a shaman? Like he raised the dead, he manipulated nature, he healed. Well, he interestingly enough, uh, they cover they they cover some of this in these ancient texts, and he was not well regarded at all by the Jewish people, that, you know, because he was mm-hmm. a Jew, right? And uh, some some are saying that he was a rabbi as well, and none of the none of the Jewish people really had any respect for the guy at all. Uh, but what Jesus was doing was was the incantations. Jesus knew uh, of some of these recipes that I'm talking about. And he was able to come at it with pure, with purity, to step outside the one of gain and the fear of loss. And he was subsequently able to walk on water, able to change the molecular uh, structure of rocks into... Uh, food or of water into an alcoholic beverage, uh, you know, able to change the manifestation of creation in very specific formats, able to call the fish into a net, uh, you know, able to do these things, and and yet unable, unable to change the minds of men, even with all of those miracles, right? He was still crucified and i'm not buying that he was crucified he was he, he i think he, he was he was being used as a martyr to be sure 
but you know, I don't buy the modern day Christian. You know, well, he died for our sins. You know, it's like bullshit. The only person who's going to die for your sins is you. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, it's interesting because I often think about that actually coming from a Christian background. I think though that he could have changed their, I feel he could have changed their minds, but he chose not to. I think. That's I what think, I'm saying. He set, it, he set himself up as a martyr. He set himself up as a martyr because he knew the power of martyrdom. Mm, okay, and, I'll ponder on that. He was little. right. Well, he was right. He was right. Well, Same with, uh, mm, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he you know, he allowed himself, as you say, to have the nails pounded into him and to to be set up on Golgotha and and hung there, you know, for the crows to peck at his eyes and the and the vultures to tear at his flesh. I mean, you know and then of course, you know, we have the other the other scenario where the true Jesus basically escaped to the south of France and created the Merovingian dynasty. So, you know, pick and choose what what story you want to follow. Either way, Kundalini plays a prominent role within that. And and it does support the the idea that when you come into the levels of grace where you can speak to the divine directly and interject divine uh, assistance, divine guidance, divine recipes into the human equation, well, you'll get results. You will get results. And you will have success. But you've got to step out of fear of loss and want of gain, like he did. Okay. I, my call was dropped. I don't know if you noticed. Oh my God, your call was. I've been talking to the air. I've been talking to the air no. the whole time. No, no oh you're not. You're not. You were talking to everybody except me. Um, suddenly, I was booted out there, and I laughed. I'm going. You had to go to the bathroom, I didn't you? Come on, just just set that. <laughs> okay, Dan, thank you very much. But Chris, I, could, I couldn't hear him, and I didn't know if I was gone or he was gone. And then um, I was gone. Nobody knew. <laughs> but I missed all of that, so I'm sorry. I don't know what you said, but I... Um, well, you have to listen to the, to the, to the I show. I would have to listen. <laughs> and it's funny because I said, yes, I'll ponder that, and the next thing, I'm out of there. <laughs> it's like... The finger <laughs> came down. <laughs> okay, Chris. Well, it's been really interesting. Um, really interesting. I'm very interested in, in all of that and the shamanic aspect, the Kundalini and um, Kundalini. Well, the, the Mesopotamian uh, aspect, too. I mean, you know, you trace it all the way back to the Sumerians uh, and Gilgamesh and, uh, well, she dropped again. So no, I'm here. <laughs> oh, it says, oh, that's the old sign. Uh, so yeah, you trace it back a very, 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 very long, a long ways, uh, as far back as the the Sumerian kings, the King Sargon the Great, and the uh, the uh, the initiation of Inanna, uh, also known as as Ishta, also known as uh, as many many different goddesses throughout the pantheon. Um, I'm trying to think of that Greek word it's just escaping me for the moment uh, um, but yeah the warrior goddess uh, the poetic goddess the sacred mother um, tracing it all the way back I mean it's it's very 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 interesting how these things come about and and it all boils down to people being given into the survival aspect of the fear of loss and want of gain. So fear of loss means, you know, not being killed by a predator, right? Want of gain, meaning, you know, you can find enough food and shelter to survive the, the coming years. So, you know, it means a lot of these things. And it looks like I have a question from Mr. Mohan. 
So I'm going to come on over to Mr. Mohan here. And, and hello, Mohan. Hello, my friend. How are you? You're, I am doing well. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good. So my question is, uh, what if, if somebody is doing a healing to somebody and uh, at the moment when they're doing the healing, they don't have any fear of loss or want of gain. But after some miracle happens out of their healing, the other person gets healed of whatever they're suffering from. And after some time, if they uh, get a feeling that I did that and uh, they use that particular scenario to bump up their, like, popularity kind of thing, does that earn any karma associated with the healing? Oh, for sure, for sure. It's a good question, Moan. I'm going to push you in the blue here. There's a lot of wind there. Yes. So, <laughs> there we go. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that question. So, yeah, uh, if a person is able to to punch a hole through their fear of loss and want of gain scenario. And, and as I said, you know, when we do that, we, we are able to open to the divine in, uh, influence upon the specific situation. And as uh, Mohan suggests, the, the individual decides to, to use it as a form of ego aggrandizement or to take credit for it or to, to do that. So, for, so one, yeah, you know, the, the action of self-aggrandizement is in of, and of itself an opening to a karmic uh, redemption for the future. Uh, so they will get to go through whatever karma that that action uh, consists of. Maybe, maybe having someone in their family die, even if they punch a hole through the fear of loss and want of gain. And what then? What then? See what I'm saying? What then? Oh my gosh, I did that and I did that and I did that and they still died. What's going on? Right? Uh and, and so it's very, very important uh as you as you do uh you know push through the fear of loss and want of gain to continue continue the, the momentum. Don't just push through it and then fall back into it which is an easy thing to do. Don't push through it and then fall back into egocentrism. Now, this happens a lot with kundalini people. Uh, you know, they, the kundalini will come in, incrementally often to people. Uh, they'll gain a certain level, and they'll stay at that level and try to process that level. Then when they're through processing that level, go to another level <coughs> and process that level with, frequent bursts of regression, you know, from the previous level. So in a sense, it's like three steps forward, two steps back, three steps forward, two steps back, four steps forward, two steps back, you know, and so on and so forth. It's, you know, it's a pattern of, of learning what it is to push through one level into the other level, but still, standing on the other level as you push through to the next level until you're finally able to stand on the next level. You know, that is the, the typical level of momentum that we have. And I see this quite a bit uh, uh, with people that I work with closely, you know, you know, they're, they're always popping back sometimes, you know, if, if we've got seven stages, well, you know, you'll get to stage one and then you'll get to stage two, but that sometimes you'll go back to stage one and then, then you get to stage two and you go to stage three. Well, sometimes you'll go back to stage one. Sometimes you go back to stage two. But for the most part, you're, you're, you're now standing in stage three, moving into stage four with various little regressions back into stage one, two, or three while you're standing on stage four. So, you know, that is often the case. That is, that is how it goes with people. And sometimes if you're standing on stage four, and you go back to stage two and you hang out there for a while because there were certain areas in stage two that you didn't really get down very well. And so you've got, this is why Kundalini is such a sine wave, such an up and a down and an up and a down and up and a down, because we have to revisit some of the areas that we didn't quite get yet, but eventually we do get it. Uh, whether in this life or the next life, it doesn't matter anymore. 
Because when you die and you reincarnate, which you will do, uh, you will go to exactly the level of kundalini expression that you had when you died. Pick it up from there. The only difference is, is, is as a child, you won't know why you're being uh, inflicted with such challenges that go along with the level of kundalini that you were at when you passed. So I'm going to go back to Mohan. You understand what I'm saying, Mohan? Yes, Master. And one more quick question. Uh, yeah. If somebody is going through something, say, for example, a health issue or some emotional issue, that might be due to the uh, karma they are trying to burn with by facing through that. If, if uh, some of the Kundalini awakening person uh, goes to them and gives a healing to them, isn't it? Uh, isn't the person uh, interfering with the divine will? What that supposed uh, person is supposed to go through, uh, the person is coming and trying to heal it with uh, oh, yes. his grace. Isn't he? Even if he's doing nothing for the uh, fear of loss or want of gain, but still by doing the healing, isn't he gaining some karma from that? Well, first of all, the healing won't happen. <laughs> now, huh. okay. now let me let me let me take this further. If uh, if that person tries to use uh, magical or sorcery based recipes uh, to make that person better, they get a double karma. Because if if that karma for that person was to be sick, uh, then that person is going to be sick no matter what. Uh, you do to try to influence it, except if you try to artificially uh, create a scenario where they're, where they're not going to die uh, and you use like a magical incantation for them to live, well then, yeah, you will assume some of the karma of that individual and they may not make it anyway because divine rules, divine rules, divine dominates. Uh, it, and, and even if you're doing a, an incantation, you're putting that into the divine, the heavenly realm anyway. And you're counting on the forces of, of whatever it is you're calling upon to work the divine will, you know, towards the, the healing of that individual who should not be healed. And so typically what's going to happen is that person's going to die anyway, or they're, or they're not going to get healed anyway. Uh, because because of that. But the scenario is also that person needs to die. Their karma needs to, to be what it is. They need to pay that price. For you to slow them down based upon your fear of loss and want of gain, uh, for you to slow them down because you don't want them to go. You love them so much. They're just too young or they're too pretty or you're too much in love with them. Uh, that you don't want them to go, and you're basing it on even even uh, on anything other than the will of God, then you're you're counteracting that. Now you're not counteracting it when you give a prayer, because then you're asking God. There's a very big difference between asking and assuming or doing. Assuming that you have the right. To refuse that person's karma Assuming That you have the right to play God or goddess Upon the lives of those people <laughs> Yeah you'll incur some, some pretty strong karma For, for making those choices You know yeah, So should, this is why should, should we at the, all do the healing at all Like no, by we doing healing to healing. somebody Absolutely do the healing do the healing, but do it with the permission of the individual, number one, and number two, with the permission of divine guidance. So in a way, okay. you don't do the healing. The person opens themselves up for the healing to come from the kundalini, from divinity. And that is a very, very, very pure and above the fear of loss and want of gain scenario. Because you're not incorporating it within your own impure self of fear of loss and want of gain 
you're incorporating it and giving it to the appropriate divine force that can then see uh, what can or cannot be done and then do it. Okay. Okay. So you can have the healing. Divine intervention happens. Yeah, when you give a healing, we we generally ask for whatever is appropriate for them at this moment is the healing that has to be given, right? Not uh, whatever is appropriate for me, for the person to have, right? Right. I mean, but people, you know, there's some there's some leeway within karma. I mean, people have done good things in their past too, and if they have enough good things in their past that they can pull on that that the divine will see is, is, is of a karmic expediency, <laughs> then, uh, then they can be saved. Uh, divinity and, and karma kind of go hand in hand. I mean, it controls the Lords of karma, so to say, are of a divine grace. And so uh, dispensation can be given if the karma of the individual asking for the healing uh, and and the karma of the individual praying for the healing can coincide, and both can can kind of break through that fear of loss and want of gain. The healing can be given; it can be received and given, and nobody is taking credit for it because, hey, that was the will of the divine based upon the energy and the power that people were giving. Now, uh, she's showing me right now. Okay, let's talk about Huna. Let's talk about the the. Uh, the language and the belief system of Huna, where you have the ability to generate so much Kundalini that in a flash, a bright flash of light, you can heal that broken arm or that broken leg or that person's life. Well, once again, once again, you have the Kundalini to such a degree. You have that infusion of divinity to such a degree that it and you can initiate a healing upon that individual because it is their karma, their karma that has allowed them to come into your presence. Even if it's just somebody on a hike, you know, somebody falls and breaks their leg on the hike and, and, uh, and, and Mohanananda happens to be there and he places his hand upon them and uh, and boom, a big flash of blue white light, and and that bone is reset, and that that leg is basically healed right then and there. Uh, you have had to be able to, to come into the divine continuum to that degree to be able to do that. You have had to release the levels of fear of loss and want of gain in order to do that. So you have begun to act within a semi-divine behaviorism. And this allows you to do this without accruing karma because you're walking hand in hand, leg to leg, step by step with the divine. You are actually a divine representative upon this world. And so you can do the healing without incurring the karma. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's Thank you, what we're talking about with the Kundalini. Okay. Okay, my friend. All right. Yeah. All right. I'm going to put you here in the blue. And uh, do you have a comment on that, Santara? Um. The asking, the healing, the prayer itself can be part of the karma too, can't it? That's what you're saying as well, I think. Maybe. Yes. The what? So the asking, <laughs> the asking, okay, because I'm just thinking, it takes me a minute or two. The asking the divine, the, the healing that's been given, the act, that of itself is part of the karma of the person, of the people. Am I making sense? Um, mm, well, <laughs> no. I'm, 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 I'm pondering. I'm pondering what you're saying. Uh, what I'm saying is that it would the, say it would, it would be would... along the lines. The more I'm like, say, the mother and the child, right, or the father and the child. Uh, if the child is sick and the father is praying for the healing of the child, 
then yes, that would be part of the karma of the individual, both individuals, the child and the father. If you meet the hiker on the road, you know, on the on the yeah. trail up the hill, that's not necessarily part of your karma, but it's part of the divine uh, game plan, so to speak. Uh, everybody had to get up at a certain time in the morning and pack their gear and get up on the trail on the mountain for everybody to meet up when that hiker breaks the leg, right? And so when you and, and then you bend down and, and you're able to put that t- all together, then yeah, there is in many ways, as I mentioned in the past, there are no random events for Kundalini people. Mm-hmm. Okay, cousin, thank you. Mm. So will we go on to questions? Yeah, let's do. It. Okay. So there are a few there. We, we today, have a so we I'm, have a new we have a new caller though. Can you ask them? Uh, maybe I they will. Have will a I question. ask you a sure? Will I ask you a question you ask, and then yeah. go to them? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um. So can you please ask Prism, is it true that no matter what a person does to you, it is to be forgiven? Yes. <laughs> Are you going to expand? <laughs> it is true. I mean, it's just, I mean, that is a true. Go ahead. Go ahead. Talk to him. Uh, okay. Yeah. And it's not the easiest thing. I'm not ever going to tell you it's easy. You know, somebody raped your daughter and you've got to forgive them. Are you kidding me? I want to castrate them, you know, is the typical thought. Uh, so, yeah, it is it is so. It is so. And And once again, you need to, as a Kundalini person, you need to reach outside of your animal natures. You need to reach outside of your fear of loss, which is an, an which is an animal nature, and your want of gain, which is an animal nature. You've got to reach outside the egotism. You've got to reach outside the egotism, and you've got to understand that as you reach outside your animal natures, you're opening yourself up to the divine natures. Okay. And as you open yourself up to divine nature, well, that is when many, if not most, if not all, of the miracles can happen for an individual. And this is what Kundalini is teaching, at least teaching through me to do. You've got to reach through fear of loss and want of gain, which are the animal natures, which are the natures that are blocking your path towards towards the... uh, the heavenly skill sets, so to speak. Okay. That's what we're talking about Thanks. here. Are you there, everybody? Yeah, okay. Yeah, All right. I'm, yeah. thank you, Kristen. Okay, so yeah. there's a question here, and it's um, that lady will, will press number one if she's a question. It's her first time listening, so okay. welcome to her. Um, okay, so I feel very depressed very low every day I've no joy and no interest I try and push myself to interact with people but it is so hard have you any suggestions for me please stand by second view you need to get start giving service to other people you need to start giving of yourself instead of expecting things to come to you for no reason Volunteer somewhere, volunteer or, or in some way give selfless service for others instead of waiting for yourself to get healed. Uh, get up, get out, and start serving others. And as you serve others, so will you yourself be served, and this will bring you out of that depression. Over. Thank you, Kristen. This one is from the group, and it's um, people are listening to this now. I said I'd ask you it. When I touch my head, I get what I can only describe as my front teeth pulsating and a metallic type feeling or taste in my mouth. It doesn't bother me. It's just strange. 
and the person asked, has anyone experienced anything like this? Would you speak on that, please, Kevin? Well, yeah, yeah. That's what happens when people put their tongue on a certain part of, of my foot. Uh, the tongue tip, uh, yeah, when, when, now she's just touching her face somewhere. Is that what it is? What is she doing? Yeah, when I touch my head. She's not is there anywhere on the head. <laughs> no, just when I touch my head, I get, but I can only. Like what? Right. I mean, where the back of the head, the front of the head, the side of the head. The forehead. I don't know, but Shauna, if you're listening, if you press the button here on the page and you're listening, maybe type that for Chris. Yeah, let's go. Let's go to the Obviously, next question. Give her, give her a chance to do that. Okay, give her time to do that. Okay, Shauna. So next question coming up. Um. Okay. It's a it's a mouth one as well, Chris. <laughs> Interesting. I was wondering if any of you went through this. My mouth feels very sensitive. At times, the roof the roof of my mouth gets swollen. The side of my tongue at the back feels so strange. My whole mouth feels sensitive. The inside of my nose feels raw, like you have a terrible cold, but I have none. And last night, at times, it feels like my whole lips are going to break out in cold sores. I went through a lot of throat symptoms. They eased a little now. I even had a jaw lock. A while ago, I could hardly open my mouth. I would like more insight on this, please. Keep the tongue tip up behind the upper front teeth, number one. I don't think they're doing that as much as they should, number one. Number two, uh, these are all kundalini symptoms, so don't worry about it so much. Uh, Allow them to occur, go through them, and trust that the process is changing you. And when we transform, and we transform in these areas, things are going to be a bit raw. It's not going to be just a smooth little thing where we don't have to feel any kind of a change or any kind of an irritation. Go to a two-year-old and and talk to them about growing new teeth. This is the same thing that's happening to you. Okay, You're going through levels of change. So, yes, some things are going to swell. Some things are not going to swell. Some things are going to get very sensitive. Some things won't. I mean, it is the way of change, and the change is going to be particular to you. So the next person will not have the exact same symptomology that you're going to have. It's not like you can compare all two-year-olds with each other because you can't. You know, all two-year-olds are going to have a problem with teeth and and the pain of the teeth coming in. It's all going to hurt, all of that stuff. But with the Kundalini scenario, because we have different karmas, and karmas are directly impacted, uh, when we do go into the transformation, so there's going to be different levels of symptomology. So you need to just keep the tongue tip behind the upper front teeth. Uh, bring your eyes up in meditation. This person's not saying whether she meditates or does any kind of a practice. So, you know, that is the mystery. So what is she doing and what isn't she doing? And so until she gives us a broader implication of what she is actually participating with, then uh, uh, the the clarity of the answer is always going to be clouded over. Okay, okay. Thanks, Prism. Um, I, I think she's doing a practice. Um, but anyway, can I just bring your attention maybe to a little bit of what she asked about the throat symptoms and that jaw lock? Um, and she couldn't open her mouth. And I know that these are like teething problems, but the throat symptoms that close and jaws that lock can be um, really strange. I mean, a little bit more than just mild. They can be very strange. Well, I, need, I still need and, to know what she's doing and what she's not doing. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay. Well, because that all, can that I ask all lends Catherine, itself. That, she's, that, that all lends itself. To specific symptoms. It adds okay. up. Catherine, okay. if you're on, tell us what you're doing. Don't just like make a guess. You know, I love it. You know, this is a, well, you know, Master Christian's like this super psychic dude, and he should just like, I was no. Prison. no, no, no. <laughs> I think if you were on the group, it would be different because you'd know who we were talking about. But, um, 
Yeah, she's there on the group, Catherine, and I don't know if she's listening or not, but I can go back up to Shauna, and she has said that it's the back of her head that she touches. The back of her head. And that's, well, yeah. Well, thank you, Shauna. This is a first, you know, this is the first that we've been able to communicate that way. Where is she at? Uh, live on air now. Did she just private Top email of the you? page, Shauna Ann. Top of the page there. If you uh, refresh the page. page. Okay, refreshing. And so she gets that metallic thing on her on her tongue, or she feels it. Uh, let's see here. Oh, Katrian's listening too, by the way. She's yeah, writing. Yeah, just saw that. Okay, cool. Great, Catherine. But I'm, I'm not seeing Shauna. Have you Shauna on? Okay, let me let me bump it for you because um, it would probably help to actually for you to read her words as well. One second now. Yeah, that does help me. Oh, there she is. Another question. I touched my head. Okay, I see it. I see it. Okay, now. you have it. Okay. Uh, okay, back of the head. All right. Okay. Oh, no. What? Oh, people questioning me. I got huh? I got to stop. Just a second. I got to stop this. Okay. So while Chrism is doing that. I'm done. Um, Hang on. I'm done. Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, I see. She's triggering uh in in the in in some of the the understandings about kundalini, they divide the head up having uh, a thousand petals of a of a flower. And she's touching specific petals that will that will trigger that type of a symptom on the back of her head. And uh it's okay. It's, it's all good. It's not a problem. There's nothing happening that's that's wrong. It's just that she's triggering that that particular part of her body that will give that level of symptom. And so it's kind of like flicking on a light switch and then letting go or stop. You know, you stop touching the head and that light switch goes off. And then you touch it okay. again, it goes on. And then you take it off and it goes off. And it is it is a normal, natural scenario with her. It is not anything that's going to be shared with others. It's not a typical thing. This is more along the lines with her. And Shauna, Shauna, Question, though, should she continue wait, or just stop? Sorry. Well, we need to know about her Kundalini. You know, is she actually doing anything with Kundalini? Okay. That's the thing we need to know. Okay. All right. And then uh, let's go over here to Katrian. Uh, let's see. I am listening. Thanks for the information. I didn't give you any information. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>, okay. <laughs> Katrian, come uh, on. You know what are you doing? What are you practicing? The safeties. Uh, what what kind of a practice do you have? And uh, let me know. You know, go ahead and write it out here, and I'll have a look at it. And uh, let me know what kind of a practice you have, and then I can, I can give you an answer that is, has a little more clarity to it. So thank you. Go on to the next question, please. Okay, heading over there now. Um, oh, we got a question from the listener. So here we go. Okay. Well, hello, listener. This is Chris. You're on the air. Hello, listener. This is Chris. You're on the air. You are on the air. You are still on the air. <laughs> oh, she's gone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she might have been booked up. Go ahead, my dear. Okay. Okay. Um, how can I get rid of intrusive thoughts or negative attachments that are creating them? By not attaching to the negative. By not, you know, so you don't think of the negative, you look for the positive, you look for the noble behaviors. So you want to practice the noble behaviors throughout your day as much as you can. 
the noble behaviors can really, really, really change the vector of your life away from, say, depressive thoughts or, or you know, falling into depression. Doing the service, as I mentioned to that other person, can be a very, very, very helpful thing. Uh, giving service, doing service, volunteering for service, uh, helping people at as many opportunities as you can. And then with regards to the focus, you need to begin to really place a control on the monkey mind. And that's just going to take levels of, of self-correction over and over and over. You bring yourself back to the thing that you want to focus on. So let's just say you're, uh, you're making candles, okay, and you really want to make the best candles you can make. Maybe you're making scented candles, and all of a sudden you're thinking about rugby or you're thinking about soccer or you're thinking about the car or you're thinking about your girlfriend or your boyfriend, and you're thinking about what you ate this morning. You're thinking about, oh, look at that pretty sunset. You're thinking about all these different things. You just got to self-correct yourself right back to the candle making process self-correct pull yourself back consciously and and do this over and over and over and over and what you're doing is you're developing a level of mindfulness you want to have that mindfulness you want to have that ability to to focus uh, for for long periods of time and so it's a self-corrective recipe you must constantly self-correct and this goes with so many other areas of kundalini where self-correction is the answer it is the answer you have to self-correct and you and you have to be able to to know uh that that self-correcting is the way to go you've got to be willing to go there got to be willing to go there and it takes work Ladies and gentlemen, it takes work to do this, too. It's not just easy peasy, not a problem, you know, I'm just doing this or I'm just doing that. It's You've got to make the effort. You've got to lift the finger, my friends. Okay, and I'm going to go back to the question with Katrian, and she is, can you ask that question again, Santara? I can, of course, yes. Um Okay, so her question was, um, her mouth feels very sensitive. At times, the root of her mouth gets swollen. The roof of her mouth gets swollen. The side of my tongue at the back feels so strange. My whole mouth right. feels sensitive. All right. she, she's, but, not, she's not practicing the safeties. You know, okay. she's basically meditating in her bath. And she turns to, within herself, and she's breathing. and She's bringing trauma from her past forward and work on this and and I'm going to suggest you start practicing the safeties. I'm going to suggest you start bringing that tongue up behind your upper front teeth. I'm going to suggest you do what I suggest other people do. I'm going to suggest you do the five Tibetans. You do the forgivenesses. You do the, the, the different prayers. You do the meditation. You do the pranayama at your uh, stage. Katrian, I'm going to suggest that you also do the uh, the service too. Not all about you. Now you've got your husband. I think it's your husband is starting to activate too. You need to start really changing your life in a way that supports this because it's going to change your life whether you like it or not. So you may as well really flow in harmony with this. It's not about taking a bath with 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 scented oils, which you know is is very attractive. Uh, it's about getting into the world with this. Getting into the world with this. Getting barefoot on the grass, getting, you know, swimming in the lake, uh, going with your husband and walking barefoot on a beach, um, giving service to absolute strangers off of the street or, or helping someone in. There you go. Okay. She says, I do the service already. I already help many people. Well, is it your job or are you doing this selflessly? If you're doing it selflessly, it, it counts far more than if it's your job. Like say you're a teacher or you're a, a doctor or something like that where you're helping many people, but you're also getting paid for it. I'm talking about selfless service. See, that's the thing. 
you wouldn't cut it. <laughs> you, you know, selfless means that you're not getting paid. <laughs> okay. She says, <clears throat> she says, no, because I love this. Well, then I'm going to go right back to the safeties, Katrin. You're not practicing mm-hmm. the safeties. At least I see no indication uh, from what you're telling me that you're practicing the safeties. The safeties are the path for harmony and 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 hope and and helpfulness within this within this equation. Uh, and I'll go ahead and put the safeties down there for you. www dot kundalini safeties. Come. There we go. <laughs> The safety yeah, actually, Katrine, will make a huge, huge difference. They really will. It really will. Um, it really and will. As you begin, as you begin to do them, you know, you'll be, um, if you do them diligently, if you really do them, you'll be amazed at the difference they'll make to you. Huge. Huge. And I'm going to go up to Shauna. Shauna needs to do the same darn thing. She needs to practice the safeties, too. But she's driving at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> www. Don't type any words, <laughs> Yeah, try not to type. Yeah. So there you have it. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. This is what it is. So, so go ahead. Next question, uh, Amelia. Okay. Thanks, Prism. Okay, going back over to the questions. Okay. I feel like someone is remote viewing me. Oh, I wonder if that's Shauna as well now because I moved it. I'll read the question first. I feel like someone is remote remote viewing me. Is there a way to stop this? It's always when I'm sleeping. I do psychic shielding daily. I sleep with oh, white boy. noise. And I have crystals. I really want a good pain-free okay. night's sleep. And any help is definitely much appreciated. I I lifted that from the group, and now I'm feeling it might be Shauna, and I need to check Prism. You see, I moved the questions over to my... Um, so, in fairness, I need to check if that's Shauna, so give me a second. Yeah, please. it is Shauna. It's Shauna. It's Shauna. It's Shauna. Is it? Okay. It's Shauna. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read what I wrote to Shauna here about this. Um, you know, so many people give all this advice. Uh, yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, you feel like you're being watched? Well, we all are being watched. There are far more levels of consciousness that are observing our every movement, our every thought, the, 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 the color of our aura shifting with every emotion, with every level of focus and concentration. Uh, we are all being absolutely studied. We are somebody's uh, <laughs> we, we are somebody's master's thesis, right? They're they're going, oh well, look at look what uh, the, the, the Katrian did, and oh my gosh, look what uh, Shauna's doing. And yes, my paper is on Shauna, and I observed that she's making these choices in these ways with these types of scenarios coming her way. And she's got this karma, and she's got that karma, and uh, she's, she's, you know, this is, this is, I'm really observing Shauna because she's really helping me understand what it is uh, for me to do uh, when I take a body and I take a life and I'm able to, to, to come into these types of scenarios too. I want to have the information that Shauna is asking about right now, and I want to have it, and I want to learn from her as she meets her karma and as she as she surpasses her karma and, and, and redeems it, and as she goes into uh, levels of refinement and, and, and begins to express through, through Kundalini, you know, and so we are constantly being looked at. And it's not just by, by spiritual forces. The insects are looking at us. The animals are looking at us. Uh, the life forms that we don't even know about are looking at us. So, yes, my friends, we are all being observed all the time. Get over yourself. <laughs> Get <laughs> over yourself. <laughs> what? <You're so> <laughs> 
she does what? say, doesn't she, um, that she removed everything and it made a huge difference for them. Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't see that. Uh, Things but I'm got continue. much worse. In, yeah, sorry for interrupting you. I just read that and I thought it was cool. So you just gotta. You just gotta let it go. You gotta let it go. Let them see you. Let them see you as you take a dump, as you take a pee, as you take a shower. They're all going to see you anyway. There's nothing you can do about this. Okay? The only people you can hide from are other people in a flesh body. Everyone else can see you if they want to. And even if they're remote viewing you, you know, they're messing up by doing that, by invading your privacy. But you know what? Uh, wearing an amulet, you, you, I mean, some of the amulets will work, but you probably don't have access to those amulets. What I would suggest you do, if it's really bugging you, get some uh, black tourmaline and uh, and just get rid of the fear of it. Get rid of the fear of it. You don't need to have that fear. Um, and, you, and, and really, there are no secrets. There are no secrets. We're in these flesh bodies and behind only five senses out of a gazillion senses. You know, which we placed ourselves here on purpose in order to do this work. Get rid of your fear of being observed by other consciousness. Get rid of it. And I see where Shauna said, I, I have to say, I just removed the items and I already feel lighter. So much appreciation. from Absolutely. Uh, all gratitude to Kundalini, really. Um, but I'll continue on. Uh, you know, there are far more beings watching us and learning from us or trying to influence us than we are taught to know. Just let it go. You do not need to have all of that that you're doing. You know, all of these shielding and, you know, an archangel coming in, not that she's saying that, but I'm just kind of adding in what I hear from other people saying, calling in the archangels, calling in the guides, calling, wearing a silver armor suit. Uh, covering yourself in this or that, wearing this gemstone or that gemstone or that crystal or that amulet, wearing this talisman or that sigil or, you know, all of these different things. Stop being such a chicken shit. (laughs) Oh, my God, Sean, a new member. (laughs) I love it. Stop being such a coward. You know, develop but isn't some it true that, oh, <laughs> But we're Wait a minute. I'm, all of this I'm not stuff. done. I'm not done. I'm not done. I'm on a, I'm on a tear here. Just let okay. it go. You do not need all that you're doing. That just attracts what you're fearing. You're basically coating yourself in, in blood and then swimming among the sharks and going, oh, this is supposed to keep the sharks away from me. When in fact, Doing the opposite. This is funny. Uh, so, so you know, you're coating yourself in honey and expecting the bear not to take an interest. Uh, so just let it go. Trust in Kundalini. Trust in Kundalini, really. Do not trust the man-made contraptions, talismans, symbols, sigils, prayers, ideologies, philosophies, that the human beings are creating in order for protection because it will not work without divine permission. And if you have the Kundalini, you don't have divine permission to wallow in fear. And if you're trying to get the Kundalini, you won't get it if you allow yourself to wallow in fear. You're going to constantly have fear tests. So something scary is going to be presented to you and, and, and everybody who's watching you is going to sit back and go, okay, all right, all right, this is what she's got. Let's let's see what she does. Oh, look at her. Oh, my God, she just put on some super archangel fear shield thing. Oh, my gosh, look at that. She's got this crystal. She's Her whole head, she's got this neck thing now. Her, her chin's like to her chest because she can't lift her head up because she's got so many rocks wrapped around her neck. Don't go into fear. Face your fears. Easier said than done. I understand. I understand that. Face your fears and don't respond to, you know, a fear test that is unnecessary. Okay? I mean, don't, don't, 
go into fear if you're being tested for fear. Over. Thank you. Yes, I was going to say too, Chris, and I think needing protection is like a kind of a conditioning that we can be given from commercial new age interests as well, you know. Um, you know, that you have to buy this and you've got to buy that. And definitely, um, I think needing protection amplifies fear. Exactly, as you like, I totally agree with you. It's yeah, like, I, it is like I, attracting, totally. it's like attracting the share. I totally yeah. agree with you too, totally. <laughs> um, there are some more conversations there. Um, Katrine has added, at the moment, I also feel for weeks, my third eye open all the time, like there is a hole between my eyes. Is this something only temporary? Or will it be constant and feel like a tight shower cap around my head? Can you repeat that, please? Katrine on the group is saying, at the moment, I now feel, I now for weeks feel my third eye open all the time, like there is a hole between my eyes. Is this something only temporary or will that be constant? And I feel like a tight shower cap is around my head. The tight shower cap is the golden helmet. Um, that's a normal thing. Uh, it, it also people also uh, describe it as, as wearing a bowl on top of your head, but it's a bowl that kind of follows the hairline all the way around. Um, so yeah, tight shower cap is a good idea. Uh, no, that will fade. That will fade over time. Just give it time. Let it do its thing. Uh, it's basically the thousand petal lotus is getting to know itself. All the petals are, are getting to to have an infusion. It's it's all good with that. Now, what was the first part there? The first part is the third eye open all the time, like there is a hole between her uh, eyes. Third eye is not open all the time, please. You know, that's just kind of overdoing it a little bit. Because if the third eye was open all the time, and if it was actually open, open, then she wouldn't be able to really understand anything of what she was seeing. Nothing. Because it would be a big jumbled mess. So it's not open all the time. I think somebody's just stepping over into uh, over overdoing the description. Now, if you have a hole between your head, that's fine. That's fine. It's starting to open starting to open and you'll be you'll get to see some visions and you'll get to maybe see some more lights and and the the, the phenomena of a, of a of an opening third eye will begin to come to you in ways that you can manifest a level of understanding kundalini will drop in understanding for you with that but uh, yeah, try not to 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 go too far into into the description that you have a hole in your head like somebody put a a 45 caliber pistol and pull the trigger. This is not it. You are not like totally open within the third eye. You wouldn't even be able to type if you were totally open in the third eye. You wouldn't be able to type. You wouldn't be able to speak. Yes. <laughs> he, he took a I suppose <laughs> may, could. <laughs> Okay, so if we were to say that it isn't her third eye, but it is the area that the sensation is tactile and it feels like a hole, that would necessarily okay. mean that her third eye was open, though. Uh, no, no, it just means that it's being activated. Emma, uh, you're yeah. on the, uh, Emma Travis, you're on the uh, the chat room there, and I'm I'm trying to get, off of you. Somehow I got connected onto you here and and it's, it's it's so there's a bunch of stuff I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to I'm looking I'm trying at to, that there and um, do you want me to I, fix that? Yeah, fix that Hello? for me. It's hard for me to figure Hello? it out. I'm I don't know, I don't know how to get off of that. Weird. It's so weird. Okay, let me First see. Yeah. Give me back this. Breaking the rules, Emma. So irritating. <laughs> that is so irritating. My God in heaven. Okay. All I right. Can't... So I apologize. Um, I'm, I'm using just hearts here. So 
So maybe this will work here. Yep, that's not working. Okay, so she's back again. She's back. She's she's um, a sentence. Okay. Uh, Are we talking about the thing on the chat room there? So it's fine. Okay. You're talking about the chat room. Okay. All right. Okay, so all is well there. Okay. I, I guess. So you can have um, sensations or tactile sensations within the head that feel as if there's a hollow or a hole, but that doesn't mean that that hole is an open eye, an open Right, eye. right. I, you know, people get a little carried away with their with the descriptions. Um, uh, you know, Partial an open part. third eye, a, a wide open third eye at the stage that she's at right now would send her straight to the psych ward. Straight. Hmm. It's a it's a ticket to to very very strong difficulties. Mm. Extremely strong difficulties. Okay, yeah. goes on though. Um, is very strange, and and I suppose you know when it's new as well, and people are trying to discover a way of expressing it, and um, it's not so easy, you know, because some well, of the tactility is like whoa, you know. I totally understand that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, I don't think. Um, oh, Shauna says you're awesome. I'm cracking up. She's at the vet now. Thank you very much for helping. My deepest gratitude. I've been all alone and didn't know what has happened to me. Phew. <laughs> That's cool. Thank you, Shauna. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for thank you for asking the questions. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I think uh, that's it, really, Quism. Um, well, that's good. That's yeah. good because we got two minutes left. Any last words? Yeah. <clears throat> no, no last words. Well, I'd like to say thank you once again to Mohan and to Rosemary for organizing the seminar. I'd like to thank all the seminar participants. Uh, and I see some of them there on the group. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you all. I'm looking forward to Germany. Uh, and uh, We'll see you this time next week. I hope the time, I hope the time is helpful for people, and I hope we can we can, we can uh, continue our discussion with those who are there at three o'clock. So I will go ahead and end it like we started it. And blessings to you, Centara, for supporting this program. Here we go. Ah. Uh...
Thank you very much for sharing this moment with us. Hopefully you had a lot of fun. The intelligent kind, the conscious kind, the compassionate kind, the inspired kind, the dangerous kind. As you leave, please keep these words in mind. Think for yourself and question authority. Think for yourself and question authority. Thank you very much.